Hello, and welcome to the Seeding Social Good podcast by Turnkey. I'm your host, Katrina Van Huss, uh, the founder of Turnkey 34 long years ago. Today, I am with the CEO of the Pan Mass Challenge, Jared Collins, and Jared has been CEO for an entire 17 days as part of, as, uh, as of this broadcast. And before that, he was both president and CEO, so he's been with the organization for um, almost five years. So we're going to talk about that particular amazing event and what it has done over the years, the state of the industry, and where you, Jared, are taking the organization. Let's jump in. Welcome. Thank you. Glad to be here, Katrina. Describe to me how you landed in this chair right now. Not CEO that long, uh, but I've been at the Pan Mass Challenge now for coming up on five years. My story goes back about uh, 15 years ago when uh, a friend of mine, a friend of our families, had lost uh, uh, the husband to cancer. So our friend Nancy formed a team to raise money for the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute in Boston, which is where her husband had been treated. I got introduced to this amazing event called the Pan Mass Challenge. Uh, I was really amazed to see that there were, you know, 6,000 plus other people who had not the same motivations necessarily, but other uh, adjacent motivations to try cool. to eliminate this scourge that we know is cancer. And that was really my introduction. I've ridden the Pan Mass Challenge every year since, and I joined the staff, as I said, five years ago, I became CEO about 16 days ago. Um, I'm following in the footsteps of an amazing gentleman named Billy Starr, who yeah. founded the Pan Mass Challenge in 1980. Uh, uh, in his case, he was grieving from the death of his mother. And uh, he found that um, 36 other people back in 1980 uh, similarly hated cancer as much as he did and liked cycling. And so they got on bikes and rode from Springfield, Massachusetts, out to the tip of Cape Cod in Provincetown. Uh, the story goes that they got lost, they ran out of food and beverages, uh, and uh, had, I'm sure, numerous flat tires, but they all made it out to the tip of Cape Cod, and then they said, uh, that was awesome, let's do it again next year. And That's the amazing. Mass Challenge. That's amazing. They raised $10,000, uh, and, uh, and this past year, we raised $72 million. Which is incredible. So, so Billy is still in the organization and you two are coexisting. Um, I'm doing the same thing with someone that I recently, I stepped back from CEO and, and now I work for her. So tell me how that works over there. Sure. So uh, Billy, of course, has an unmatched level of um, social capital, if you will, built up with the thousands upon thousands of alumni in the Pan Mass Challenge. And when I say alumni too, it's not just the riders, but we're supported every year by about 3,000 or so volunteers who man the water stops and hand out registration materials and get in vans and drive around to repair both people and bikes as needed. So uh, he has a tremendous following and, uh, and, and that um, Pied Piper effect, if you will, uh, has gone on now for 44 years. Uh, this will be our 45th wow. year coming up. We literally have three generations of riders uh, in the Pan Mass Challenge, riders and volunteers uh, who turn out every year and will basically uh, plan weddings, family reunions, birthdays, everything around the first weekend of August, which is when we hold the Pan Mass Challenge. So um, so he's, he's really the face of the organization uh, in many, many public settings. Uh, we also have a big celebration coming up this year. In our 45th year, we're going to cross $1 billion given wow. to Dana wow. the Cancer Institute for a period of time. So we're going to, we have some big celebrations planned for that, um, a lot of press around that. And, uh, and then lastly, Billy helps out an awful lot in terms of bringing in major gifts, uh, estate gifts uh, yeah. that we hadn't anticipated, frankly, uh, back yeah. in 1980, when we first started this thing off. But uh, this Pan Mass Challenge has meant so much to so many people now, and I said generations of yeah. families, that they want to give back and they want to make sure that the PMC will continue on in perpetuity. I love it. So many of the people who listen to this podcast are social good professionals. Help them understand what in your background, both um, once you met Pan Mass Challenge and before then, what prepared you for the CEO role? Um, yeah, I'm not sure that you're ever really prepared for a CEO role. I'm afraid there are some things you just have to figure out on the job. Yeah. Uh, but I would say that I've been a CEO before, and I've also worked with CEOs for most of my career. I had the good fortune in the first half of my career 
to be a funder of and supporter of um, technology companies, mostly startups. Mm -hmm. And so I worked with a lot of CEOs through the inevitable people challenges that they have, both recruiting people as well as having to de-recruit them sometimes uh, if they don't work out. Uh, fundraising uh, is always top of mind, especially if you're a young company and you're consuming a lot of cash. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then um, trying to figure out, you know, what the customer wants. Uh, you think you know sometimes, and then that target can shift. Uh, but you're constantly looking to give the customer a fantastic experience. And that's true in the for-profit and nonprofit worlds. Yeah. So I was fortunate in that I probably backed, oh, I don't know, 25 or so CEOs in my career. Uh, I've been on the boards of nonprofits where I've supported an executive director or a head of school. And so trying to do some combination of Pattern matching, figuring out what works and what doesn't, yeah. recognizing that every situation is unique. Uh, running yeah. the Pan Mass Challenge is nothing like I've ever tried to run before uh, or even that I've tried to sort of coach another CEO in. But um, so far, so good. We're having a great time. Uh, we've opened up our registration uh, for the summertime ride, the one in that yeah. first weekend of August, uh, to, uh, to terrific uh, response so far already. We opened the second week of January. And we'll keep registering people right up until the end of June. Love it. Love it. Now, um, you said something earlier that I want to dig into. So you started as an event. The entire organization started as an event. But it sounds like, based on what you're saying, that you are now expanding into a full-fledged development department in some ways. Can you talk about okay. that? You mentioned major gifts. Um, can you talk about that? You know, What are your thoughts about that? And how can that work when um, you know Dana-Farber has a massive development department? Indeed, indeed, yes. Well, first of all, we work tremendously closely with Dana Farber, uh, mm -hmm. with their philanthropy department, and um, we're honored to support them. We're, um, I guess, not unique necessarily, but I think fairly rare in that we're a five hundred one c three set up to support another nonprofit. And that's yeah. all we do. If the Dana Farber wasn't there, we wouldn't have any reason for existing either. So all of the money that we give, and that's a hundred percent out of every rider raised dollar, goes to research and treatment at Dana Farber. Mm -hmm. uh, I would say, I would call us dabblers uh, in the area of, um, of development at this point. I would say, first of all, we have no one on our staff who's a full-time development professional. Yeah. Uh, we have a staff of about 12 and a half FTEs. Uh, and we're learning as we go. I will say that growing into things like legacy or accepting major gifts has been a very organic uh, evolution for us. Uh, yeah. People have come to us and said, Jarrett, Billy, rest of the team, we really believe in what you do. And so we've put you in our state plans uh, or we really believe in what you do. Mm -hmm. Here's a check for pick a number, half a million dollars uh, to support your operations this year. Now, okay. some of our donors, whether in the case of legacy or major donors will actually give us a gift that's destined for Dana Farber and will be joined by all the other rider race funding that we do. But they believe in what we do so much that they want to um, they want to pass it through the Pan Mass Challenge. They are often riders or friends of riders, and it's a vote of confidence for them. Uh, I like to joke with people that uh, if they give to Dana Farber, but through the Pan Mass Challenge, they get kisses on both cheeks, <laughs> and uh, that seems to resonate with people. Who doesn't like praise? But certainly, there's a whole group of people, uh, talented professionals who work at Dana Farber and support any development activity that we have, uh, but then of course support direct giving to Dana Farber. Right, so it's all in the family is what I'm hearing. It's all in the family. And uh, any, again, anything given to the Pan Mass Challenge that's destined for Dana Farber passes through hundred cents on the dollar. Yeah, now do you ever see standing up direct response or middle giving programs? I know that you have a promise out to your riders that may complicate that. <clears throat> So it's a really interesting question. And it's interesting for two reasons. One, um, I know what um, direct response is, but two, I'm embarrassed to say, and I may embarrass myself in front of your listeners and viewers, that I don't know what, um, the, you call it middle giving? Yeah. I, I don't it, think I know. You know, it's sort of an amorphous beast, in my mind, at least. It's people who are not considered major givers, but they've only, you know, given 50, 100 bucks through an event. You know, uh, so, it's, it, you know, like they maybe they show up with a five hundred dollar check and you're like, oh, that's different. They don't fit in either bucket, you know. I follow you. OK, so a couple thoughts here. One, um, you should know that our average rider in the 
pan mask challenge raises over ten thousand dollars a year that's average that's uh, we have people who raise hundreds of thousands of dollars each year our, our fundraising minimum runs as low as about two thousand dollars for a weekend ride and as high as six thousand uh, yeah. dollars but then we give special recognition when they hit ten thousand and this year uh, a top ten percent donor would give about seventeen thousand so um so I, I don't I don't know if we've got a lot of middle givers frankly because the vast majority of what I consider our development department, uh, which, by the way, we dress in Lycra uh, and uh, put on bikes every, uh, August uh, week, first August weekend, uh, is, um, you know, it's 6,000, 6,500, 7,000 people yeah. strong. Yep. And they all deliver for us. I mean, we're yep. just, we're so blessed in that they care so much about the cause. They have a great experience on the weekend. I can think of none better uh, than to be pedaling along with um, either uh, 6,000 some odd pre-existing friends or the new friends you're going to meet on the weekend. Right. And then they get treated like conquering heroes as they ride down the road uh, by um, cheering family members, friends, and our volunteers. Um, so their, their donor base, do you ever see approaching them with a direct response ask or no? We really don't, actually. Mm -hmm. I would say that we're uh, extraordinarily grateful for the some 350,000 uh, of them who give to the Pan Mass Challenge every year. But Katrina, if you were riding uh, in the PMC, that's your donor that you reach out to. And I think that's really the power of, of the peer-to-peer -peer fundraising model, right? It's the opportunity for someone who's passionate about a mission to turn to her family member, her friends, uh, her work colleagues, and say, hey, I'm doing this cool thing. It's called the Pan Mass Challenge. Won't you support my ride? Mm -hmm. And that means so much more. And I think the uh, research that you and Otis and others have done will bear out the fact that the response rates are so much higher because it's a pitch, if you will, coming from Katrina. Yeah. And uh, of course, they're not going to probably in most cases anyway, uh, support a cause that they think isn't a just one. But certainly if you add the personal ask, uh, to a mission that, in the case of cancer, unfortunately touches far too many, uh, it's a winning combination. So we don't want to ever feel like our riders have been disintermediated by us. I, I think it would be, frankly, the equivalent of, of um, organizational suicide. Oh, interesting. That's a strong statement. Yeah. You feel like yeah, uh, if you went direct to the donor instead of going through the fundraiser, you feel like it would cause that big a negative reaction. Let's put it this way. I never want to conduct that experiment <laughs> to find out if I'm right. But um, here's what I would say. Uh, we, we, have, you know, we have the most productive fundraisers that I'm aware of anywhere in the world. Yeah. Uh, why would I want to break that model and run the risk of having Katrina, who has ridden with us for the last 17 years, yeah. say, you know what? I'm, good. I'm not going to sign up for number 18 because guess what? the PMC will just solicit my donors directly. So it's all good. No, what happens is if you don't come back for year 18, you don't collect the yeah. donations and Dana Farber doesn't get that money. That's amazing. Um, how well understood is that? I mean, you know, it is a fact, you know, they know it, you know it, but do they internalize it? Do you think? Oh, it's a first principle for us. I mean, we it tell is. our riders right up front, these are your donors. Mm -hmm. We'll give you two that will allow you to make it easier for you to do the ask, make it easier to follow up, yeah. find out who's responded, who hasn't. You know, so we've got a number of things that really help grease the skids for fundraising. Right. It's a daunting area for many people, right? Most people don't pop up out of bed in the morning uh, and say, boy, I can't wait to go ask for money. But yeah. the truth of the matter is that um, it's money that helps fund all of these cures. And so we feel like it, this is this is your job. If you're a rider for the Pan Mass Challenge, you're going to have a great weekend experience. But you can have a great weekend experience uh, and and not be doing a, a, a mission driven ride a lot of other places. You're here because right. you're fundraising for Dana. Period. End of story. I love it. I love it. Do you ever get pressure from Dana Farber for your list? <laughs> no, not that I'm aware of. Uh, they they uh, pardon we, me. We, so sorry. They, not at all. I, I would say that Dana Farber uh, greatly appreciates, you know, our wiring them in this case of the last year, you know, 
72 million dollars on you know new year's eve uh, each year so no it's they understand the rules of engagement uh we have a tremendous relationship with their philanthropy department um uh, oftentimes uh if if they are trying to um uh if they're trying to reach someone right with an mm -hmm. appeal who's a who's a mass challenge rider uh we're happy to say yep 17 year rider here's how much they raise each year uh we'll share that level of information with them but they need to have a separate relationship uh with that rider uh as an individual if they want to solicit them well interesting um why do you or how do you think that your job might be different from a CEO who also manages the mission side? So I talked to a lot of CEOs and they, you know, of course, they have a heavy emphasis on fundraising, but they're also managing the research, the application of funds for um, mission delivery, that sort of thing. How does that change your mindset or your job? Well, first of all, I have tremendous admiration for an organization uh, and a leader who could do both. Um, uh, I don't know how I would do it, uh, um, uh, but uh, I probably wouldn't sleep very much. And uh, in my case, uh, my team and I, we have the luxury of focusing on one thing. That's putting on world-class events and giving people uh, every possibility of raising as much money as possible for the cause. Yep. You know, 100 cents a dollar gets passed through. We don't really need to worry about a lot more. We've got to control our costs, of course. We've got to give customers, whether it's a donor uh, whether it's a rider, a volunteer, even a sponsor, a great experience uh, so that all of them will come back the following year mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, a little surprise and delight along the way. And hopefully we're all having some fun. I love it. So you've read um, both of the books, I think that Otis and I wrote. And so you will understand this question maybe better than even the audience. Um, so you have what we would call a bit of a transactionalized relationship. There's a high required minimum fundraising um, a fee, so to speak, and yet you overcome the negative um, uh, attributes of a transactionalized relationship by creating a, a different experience. And so they come away with what we would call a social relationship, even though you start as a transactionalized one. Tell us how you do that. How do you manage well, that? How do you you know, get them into that different mind space? Gosh. Um, it, it probably is almost difficult for me to describe. It'd be a little bit like asking a fish, you know, what's it like being in water? Uh, yeah. I know it's in water. This is just our environment, Christina. Yeah. And, uh, excuse me. Uh, so I think that the, 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 the way that we came about it uh, was to have a very passionate founder, uh, an executive director, who um, was just able to get people excited about the mission and the bike was a way to complete that mission, right? Mm -hmm. So um, and that's probably true places like Thawne as well. I mean, um, I'm not sure that the way we um, interact with our, our riders is so much different than the way they might interact with their participants. Um, it's true that our minimum is undoubtedly higher than theirs and in, yeah. that, and, and in the minimums of a lot of other events. But of course, we didn't start back in 1980 by saying, to ride two days between central Massachusetts and Provincetown, you have to raise $6,000. Right. Uh, we started at a smaller level and over time, the community has grown up around us. But I think that having a high bar, if you will, really helps you self-select for a group of riders who are passionate about what they do. Yep. And, uh, and they, they, uh, this is not for you know, uh, somebody who's got just kind of a passing interest uh, and um, being part of what is Extraordinary Weekend. Um, they're all in. Yeah. And in fact, 10%, 10% of our riders and volunteers each year uh, are living with a cancer diagnosis personally. Some of them wow. will ride in treatment uh, as opposed to just in remission. So we really have uh, a tremendous um, how shall I say, uh, it, it's the heart. I mean, it's, they're, they're in a hundred percent. And so I think that it's really down to making sure that we're doing everything we can to not make that journey any harder for them. Right. So we want to continue to evolve the tools, the functions, the ease, if you will, of raising $10,000 or more. Yeah. But, um, but we've never, you know, the, the people who don't feel like they want to be involved in that, well, they just don't, they just don't sign up. Yeah. 
so um, tactically, I get, and I've never, I could, you know, can barely ride a bike. I've never done a cycling event of any sort to compare yours to, but I feel like I understand that during the event, the run up to the event, and during the event, you have high touch. It's about the mission. It's about the rider. It's about their diagnosis in some cases. Um, tell me what happens off season. So the the event ends, and I'm glowing. Yep. We've met our goal. Uh, what happens to yes. me then? So the fundraising minimum will uh, needs to be met by October first, right? Mm -hmm. So we have our event first weekend of August. And uh, we encourage our riders to keep raising right through to the bitter end. We've got riders who will raise, you know, well into the end of the year. And by the way, if they've long since met their fundraising minimum, uh, they can at a certain point, maybe in December, they'll say, you know what, I've got a little extra money. I want to put that into the 2024 account or the 2025 okay. account. Oh, interesting. Year. Yeah. They can already, if A, it tells you two things. One, they're already in for next year. Yeah. Uh, and B, they have, um, uh, you know, they, 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 they're thinking long-term, they're thinking relationships, right? I mean, that's the other yeah. thing that's so beautiful about peer-to-peer -peer fundraising is that these aren't transactions. I mean, sure, you might meet somebody at the diner and they hear you're a rider and they say, oh, tell me how I can donate to your ride. And they throw you 20 bucks. But, you know, the peer-to-peer -peer fundraising takes place in the context of relationships with your family, your yeah. college roommate, your... Uh, boss. And the, these are things that, um, uh, yes, there's a transaction. Credit card is run for $100. Here's a receipt. You can write it off against your tax. But that's not what it's about, right? It really is about continuing to build layers onto relationship. It might be that same person you ask for $100 or $1,000 uh, asks you for uh, support in another event uh, in yeah. their lives that's important to them uh, later in the year. So, um, so I, you know, I think it, the, the transactional piece obviously has to happen efficiently, has to happen in as low cost a way as possible and with as little friction as possible, but it really is down to relationships, which is actually one of the things I really like about what you and Otis have written about, no. uh, is steering away from things that look like, um, market transactions and instead continue to invest in, um, I don't know if relationship transaction is a thing, but maybe it is now. Yeah. So tell me, I'm, I'm, uh, I've never been in your event. How do I get connected? And what is my experience like the first time? Yeah. So uh, you get connected simply by going to pmc.org, uh, which mm -hmm. is our website. Um, many people, of course, don't come to us cold, but they were introduced by someone who already rides in the mm -hmm. PMS Challenge or volunteers for it, where the PMC goes past their house every August, uh, mm -hmm. like a marathon. They get excited about that and decide they want to be part of it. Um, so, uh, and I should mention, by the way, that about 70% of our riders participate on teams, right? And so this is this is the event within the event, right? This is yeah. the, the the small body of people, perhaps a lot closer to, to a Dunbar's number uh, than the 6,000, 6,500 people. Mm -hmm. So they really make that feel like it's a small family uh, of people who are riding together, uh, even if it's, um, you know, as I said, numbered in, in the thousands. Uh, so uh, once they get involved, they sign up. Uh, mm -hmm. As I said, registration is actually open now. In fact, today, mm, three and a half hours ago, well, this may air on a different day, uh, but we opened on January 17th uh, for general oh. registration. So all the okay. are welcome. Love you it. See now we've finished uh, encouraging all of our alumni to, to register. And then um, we'll keep in touch with them during the year with tips on training, on fundraising, uh, joining a team if they want to join a team, right? Some people come to it, uh, as I did, as part of a team 15 years ago, but many people don't uh, come as an yeah. individual. Uh, and then uh, there's great excitement leading up to the event itself, of course. Um, uh, if they live in a town in Massachusetts, we probably reached out to their hometown newspaper and said, hey, Katrina and these other seven people in your town are riding in the Pan Mass Challenge. Uh, sure. It happens every August. Great event. And please come out and, and cheer mm -hmm. for them and maybe support them at, at their uh, at PMC.org. Uh, the weekend itself, riders come and check in at one of two start locations, one in Wellesley, Massachusetts, the other out in Sturbridge. Uh, they uh, register, uh, well, they've already registered, but they check in and pick up their jersey, their water bottle, their socks. If they're a newbie, they, people ring cowbells for them and cheer. 
Mm -hmm. uh, then they settle into uh, a little pre-race meal uh, that could include a cold beer on a Friday afternoon, but certainly, you know, lots of good barbecue as well. Uh, music, everyone's having a good time. We have the, um, our CBS affiliate in Boston, WBZ TV, uh, will come out and cover the event. And so some of the riders might end up on TV. Uh, and then they all go to sleep, try to get a good night's sleep and they're up the crack of dawn on Saturday and, uh, and, and putting on their kit and getting a little breakfast in their stomachs and, and getting ready to ride. Wow. So uh, that repeats itself again on Sunday morning. Saturday night, we have riders who stay at the Mass Maritime Academy, which is right on the shore of the Cape Cod Canal. Uh, we rent dorms there. People bring tents if they want to sleep out. Uh, we actually, in many years, have a ship, a training ship, that can accommodate 600 riders that the Academy uses to train its cadets. Um, uh, with COVID and the fact that they're getting a new ship, we haven't had that for a few years, but we're hoping that we'll have that back, if not this summer, by next. And so it's quite an experience. And there's a big party with bands and, and uh, a living proof toast alongside the Cape Cod Canal. I should explain that briefly. So living proof is what we call those riders uh, can and volunteers who are living with a cancer diagnosis. And so those riders uh, will gather by the, uh, by the shore of the Cape Cod Canal for a massive group picture and a toast, uh, a little music uh, to um, allow them to raise a glass to another year on the planet, uh, another year uh, uh, holding cancer at bay. It's a very, very emotional uh, experience, as you might imagine. And then uh, they all clink glasses and say, hey, see you next year. Oh, I love it. That's great. What a nice way to tie it up emotionally to do that. It so um, you've described the rider experience. Talk to me about the 3000 volunteers. How do I get involved in that? Why would I get involved in that? What's the longevity of volunteers? You know, what do, I, I am guessing you create a similarly emotional interaction for them. We sure do. Yeah. So the volunteers are, are absolutely the, um, I'll say relatively unsung heroes. I think one mm -hmm. of the things that we uh, want to continue to do more of, frankly, is make sure that their, their praises are sung. But we actually have a an amazingly symbiotic relationship uh, between volunteers and riders as as you might imagine so the 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 vignette i'll paint for you is uh you know at the morning of the ride riders saddle up they ride out about 25 miles or so and stop at the first water stop for uh, some refreshments uh and uh and and you know pump up some a extra air in their tire whatever it is but we've got hundreds of volunteers at those first water stops, you know, welcoming them in, ringing cowbells and, and helping them any way that they can. Um, and uh, if you listen carefully, uh, all you hear in, in the air, probably uh, the word cloud, if you will, would be thank you, right? The riders are thanking the volunteers. Wow. The volunteers are thanking the riders. It's a very, very special, you know, kind of electrical yeah. connection that's taking place there. And it happens all weekend long, right? So, yeah. so if you like that, you know, saddle up for another 10 or more experiences of, of getting off the bike and, and just really connecting with the people who are making the Pan Mass Challenge possible. So we love our riders. Uh, many of them have um, volunteered uh, longer than most of our riders have ridden. I mean, 10, 20, 30 years. Uh, yeah. we, have a, we have a core uh, leadership volunteer team, about 180 volunteers every year that are made up of what we call head staff. They're the 15 or so sort of senior most volunteers, if you will, uh, in terms of organizing the troops beneath them. But then we've got crew leaders, we've got uh, water stop coordinators. Uh, we've actually got in April a big thank you dinner coming up for them, uh, where great. we're going to get a chance to get them all together. Many of them don't see one another on PMC weekend, of course, because they're spread out over you know, a couple hundred miles of infrastructure. Uh, yeah. So for them to get be able to have a chance to get together, tell war stories, celebrate one another's uh, longevity. Um, many of them have um, family members who ride. Yeah. Uh, some of them have lost family members to cancer. They want to give back. So it's a very, very special group of people. Um, yeah. And uh, they are incredibly unselfish and, uh, uh, and, and just consistent. They just show up. And you were a volunteer as well, right? Before you started as an employee. I, Is that correct? I, I volunteered actually at a Pan Mass Challenge kids ride uh -huh. uh, in our town of Wellesley, Massachusetts about 12 years ago and really got to know the organization a bit more through that lens. Yeah. Uh, but um, but no, most of my time has either been uh, as a rider or now in the last five years on staff. 
Got it. Um, I should mention, by the way, you asked, uh, or at least implied a question earlier about sort of what happens the rest of the year at the PMC. And, you know, we're known for our summertime ride that first weekend of August is our signature to the original PMC, if you will. But we've expanded our calendar and actually have three other events or groups of events throughout the year. So uh, in the winter, uh, we have something called Winter Cycle, which is a spin event that takes place at Fenway Park mm -hmm. uh, on about 200 bikes. And we conduct five sessions, so up to 1,000 rider sessions. And everyone there is raising money for Dana-Farber as well. Again, 100 cents on the dollar goes through. But it's a lot of fun to be uh, in, indoors where it's nice and warm and looking out over a sometimes snowy Fenway Park uh, yeah. center field yeah. uh, and, and being part of the action. In the spring, and then again in the fall, we have kids' rides. So about two dozen rides in Massachusetts, southern New England, that allow uh, our littlest participants, age three on up to maybe 12, uh, to uh, take place in their hometowns. Uh, and they are raising money for cancer research and treatment, too. And the Love fundraising it. minimums aren't as high as mom and dad's are, but it. it's still a great opportunity to get out and, 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 you know, build little philanthropists, if you will. I love it. Uh, and uh, three years ago, we started something called PMC Unpaved, and that's a gravel ride. Uh, so oh. uh, that's actually at um, about a million dollars last year, uh, the most successful gravel fundraiser in the country. Mm -hmm. And so we bring mm -hmm. people out to Western Massachusetts. They ride in the Berkshires, if any of your listeners know where that is, uh, but right on the New York border. And uh, they ride over um, a combination of, of, of asphalt and, and unpaved surfaces up and down hills. And uh, we've got great barbecues afterwards. They can stay in, uh, in this camp uh, out in Western Mass. And uh, we've got bonfires at night and music and everybody has a good time. I so we it. really try to meet our riders where they are. Yeah. Some people don't ride on the road, they're spinners. That's great, we've got you covered. Some yeah. people are, are kind of done road, they wanna go off road, we've got you there too. And then people wanna get their kids involved. I love it. I wanna go back to the volunteers. You've got 3000 volunteers and 12 employees. Clearly that indicates a skill of delegation that is um, better than most, better than almost anyone really. Um, how do you train staff to let go, to empower, to trust and verify, what is your what is your method there? Yeah, well, it's a really good point. Um, first, let me start by saying that uh, of that 180 people I mentioned before that are really our core volunteer leadership team. Yeah, I bet and you're in there, Katrina. Uh, on average, is 20 years. Wow. So what does that mean? It means our volunteers have been around longer than many of my staff. Yeah. So um, I'm not sure who's empowering whom. Uh, but I will say that um, the respect that our staff have for the institutional knowledge, the skill, and frankly, um, just the, the, the culture of what the Pan Mass Challenge is all about, um, that's carried as much by our volunteers as our staff every year. Yeah. And so um, we, uh, if we I, I wouldn't want to think about what we'd do if we, uh, if we had to try to go out and replace that volunteer um, uh, uh, body of knowledge. Um, but I would say that, you know, we've got some people who really are, they're just all in on the PMC. Yeah. They, for reasons that they either um, don't want to or, or or have other commitments in their lives, aren't on our staff. They're, they aren't um, doing this as we are 12 months of the year. Uh, but uh, we do get together with them several times during the year and make sure that um, that we're, we're staying coordinated and do all the planning that we need to for Again, in the case of our summertime ride, you know, that first weekend of August, and they're doing an awful lot of planning behind the scenes too, and recruiting, yeah. Yeah. And making sure the partners we work with that host us at these, at these venues, uh, or making sure that we've got enough, uh, 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 you know, barbecue chicken and, and uh, beverages and everything else. Um, they're, they're partners with us in every sense. Of I the love world. it. How much do they drive changes over the last many years? Oh, no, they're thought partners with us in this. I mean, we have yeah. a debrief with every late August uh, when we say, all right, what worked, what didn't? Let's do an after action report. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there's certainly plenty of other ad hoc conversations throughout the year, but they are absolutely a part of the, uh, of the planning, of mm -hmm. the improvement that we like to think we're doing every year. Yep. And, uh, and they've got great ideas because frankly, my staff of 12 or so, we can't be in every place sure. uh, throughout the weekend. Sure. Uh, would be to try. So uh, the, that volunteer leadership core is seeing more than we are. 
And that plus their longevity means that they've really got great opinions. Is, is your structure in that regard, that volunteer to staff ratio, is that unusual in uh, large cycling or even running events in your mind or in your experience? Uh, I don't know the answer to that. Um, certainly 12 full-time staff and uh, 3,100 volunteers is a tremendous amount of leverage. Uh, and so yeah. we're really blessed that way. But I don't know if there's anyone in our industry who's kind of tracked what a an average ratio is. Okay. I'm going to go with your unique. In my experience, <laughs> I think that often um, often people who lead events like yours decide that it's really easier if we pay people because then we can tell them what to do. So, you know, your system manifests a tremendous amount of trust and trust is respect and recognition. So you are pushing all the psychological buttons with your structure, I think, that uh, yields great satisfaction for everyone. Um, talk about, um, you know, your two questions. Number one, um, your immediate geography. Does that matter? Like you, often we work with clients who talk about opening in different markets. And you said something when we talked a few days ago about your particular market and why it was so right for this particular event. Can you talk about that? Sure, I'm happy to. So um, we're extraordinarily fortunate uh, here in New England in that we've got Dana-Farber Cancer Institute right in our backyards. Now, um, we sort of joke that Dana-Farber is the best place you'd ever want to be. Uh, but if you've got cancer, it's no place better to go anywhere yeah. in the world. And so um, so that is no small part, of course, of the enthusiasm people have for volunteering or riding or donating. Um, if you go beyond that, you know, Massachusetts has um, uh, blessed with lots of universities and colleges. So we have a very highly educated population. Um, they understand that uh, cancer cures don't come about by accident. You, you need to invest in them. Yep. Um, and so Dana-Farber's ratio of about 50% of their budget dedicated to patient care and about 50% for, re, uh, for research, um, I think is the sort of thing that frankly is um, very reflected in the way people think about investing in themselves um, and, yeah. and having gone to school back in this area. There's another factor, by the way, that um, makes for a great ride and makes the PMC so compelling from a weekend experience standpoint. And that is that um, you can ride from central Massachusetts all the way out to the very tip of that arm of Cape Cod, <clears throat> uh, toast your friends for a success and, and another year in the saddle. And then we can put you on a ferry and have you back in Boston in a couple of hours. Wow. And so that's good. Really unique. Yeah, and, I mean, you're really at the end of a very, very long spit of land, mm -hmm. uh, and it's a real journey when you get out there, right? You've ridden mm -hmm. some 200 miles, but then we can we can whisk you back to Boston right. uh, and into the arms of the family and friends who will pick you up at the waterfront and, and yeah. take you home for a good night's sleep. So not to disparage Cedar Rapids, Iowa, it would be tough to recreate this there for many reasons, I'm hearing. There's something about going on a journey. Uh, mm -hmm. That's that's a point point ride that I think really resonates with a lot of people. Now we have plenty of riders who participate in, for instance, our Sunday ride, uh, not on Cape Cod but on the mainland. It's actually out of Wellesley, Massachusetts, ba Babson College, and people will ride for fifty miles or even hundred miles in a big loop, and that's a lot of fun too to be able to sort of come right back to where you started. Your car's there; it's just easy. Yeah, uh, and we make it a great party too. But um, but the ability to sort of ride point to point, show up on Monday morning and say, yeah, I rode all the way out to the tip of Cape Cod this weekend. And there's a little bit of bragging rights there. Yeah, that is. That's great. Um, so speaking of other markets, are you um, are your sites set on any other markets nationally to recreate this experience elsewhere? No, we haven't we haven't got any in, in, imminent plans to do that. Um, I'd say that the. Uh, we're happy to travel as far as we think Dana Farber's broad base of experience, uh, excuse me, broad base of, of support is. Um, you know, the truth of the matter is that even though Dana Farber is one of the best in the world at what they do, yeah. it's not a name that's known well in San Antonio, Texas, right? So yeah. for us to say, well, that'd be a great place to ride, <clears throat> we might be making it a lot harder for our riders in that community to fundraise. Yeah. yeah. Uh, because their donors need to know what the institution is as well, right. or at least it helps. So no no imminent plans to expand uh, geographically, but um, the good news is 
Uh, so we have 6,000 riders who participate with us every year, and there's about 6 million residents in the state of Massachusetts alone. So we've got, we've got a few people that still get involved here, and, uh, and, and we're, we're actively out recruiting them now. I love that. I'm going to ask you one more question about, your, about yourself. Um, in nonprofit or in for-profit, if you were to get on a podcast and tell all the secrets of your success, your board would be really upset. They would not like mm -hmm. that. Why is it different for you? Why why do you disclose and share so generously? I'm gonna I'm gonna challenge your premise if I don't want if you don't mind. Sure. Uh, to say that ideas are easy, Katrina. Mm -hmm. They just ideas are easy. A lot of people don't listen to them to their own to their own loss, but ideas are easy. It's all about implementation, yeah. and uh, and so I think we're fortunate and that we've got a culture of people who. Um, are willing to listen to new ideas, as as you mentioned earlier. You know the volunteer uh, leadership gets involved in design too, not just our staff. But then we know we've got an event to put on, and so we deliver. I love uh, that. So I'm, ha I'm happy to share ideas, and <laughs> and in fact, I'm happy to not only share ideas but to cheer on those who are trying to implement them. Yeah. Because the other thing I'd say is, look, we've all got a common enemy. You know, cancer, other challenges to our health is a common enemy. Um, there's no good guys and bad guys in terms of people we might, quote, compete with. Uh, I talked to Joe Apgar at Pelotonia. I'll talk to Pete, Steve up at Princess Margaret. Uh, we, we have a common foe. And so I want to see them succeed as much as they want to see me succeed. I love that. I love that. I cannot thank you enough for being so generous. And I uh, know that the people listening are going to have more questions. If someone pops into your inbox with a question, are you okay with that? Of course. Delighted to talk to them. Very good. So I would like us to both be terribly self-promotional at this moment. Tell me how I sign up to ride. It's very easy. You only need about, I don't know, 10 keystrokes. Uh, www.pmc.org. There you go. And you're in. Excellent. Uh, there's Perfect. a ride, register ride button and, and we'll register to volunteer. Actually, I'll, I'll take back that last bit. Volunteer registration won't open for about another month and a half. Got it. Uh, and I will be terribly self-promotional. Turnkey is a consultancy, but the most exciting thing I'm doing right now is standing up an online community to connect people asynchronously, people like you and Steve and the gentleman from Pelotonia. Um, that to me is the most exciting thing that I have done in 20 years, frankly. And um, thank you for leaning in and helping me do some design on that. I appreciate that. We'll be coming to market probably in about 60 days to the general public of nonprofit professionals. So more to come on that. Um, thank you so much for being with us and being generous with your time. Katrina, thank you so much. I salute you and all the work that you do. Uh, you're too kind. Change starts with just one person, you. If today's episode got your gears turning, don't forget to share it with your network. And hey, why not drop us a review? Your review helps more people find us and spread the good. Be sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode. Until next time, this is Katrina signing off from Seeding Social Good Podcast by Turnkey. Stay inspired, keep making waves, and let's create a better world together.